Good morning, and welcome to this online gathering of SSUC, Spiritual Seekers United in Community. We are so glad that you're gathering uh, with us here for this gathering of January 17th, 2021. We welcome you wherever you happen to be joining us from. If you're here like us uh, in on the prairies in the Edmonton region or in Saskatoon, we join you from Treaty 6 territory. And wherever you happen to be, we take a moment and share gratitude for the places we find ourselves, for the land that shapes us, for the geographies that have been uh, with us and before us and will remain after us. We have gratitude for all those who have shaped the land, shaped our culture, and for whom that we now partner, for all those indigenous, for all those first peoples, for whom we have much to learn and with whom we partner. Wherever we are, we give thanks for all that has come to, to bring us to this place that we call home. We are uh, joining together in the midst of a series entitled Geography of the Heart. This morning we're taking a trip to the mountains, so come with us on our trip, whether high or low, high altitude, hills, valleys, peaks, we take a trip into the mountains with each other today. Along with Nancy Steves, my teammate, we welcome you, and we're joined here in this room today uh, by our musicians, our instrumentalists. We're joined by Deb and Catherine and Don, as well our vocalists, Pam and Pam, Pam squared, Pam times two. We are so grateful to have these wonderful musicians provide for us and lead us today. As well, we're joined in the booth by Brett and Darian, and we'll bring this to you together as we share this time with each other. May you find in what follows a geography for your heart. May you find something that speaks to you, speaks to a place you've been, speaks to a place you are, speaks to a place that you will soon find yourself. So as we join in this moment, welcome to this geography of our hearts. We meet one another in the daylight, in the light of our day star, as we turn again toward the sun, and we come together to nurture the kinds of practices that open us to the sacredness of our lives and our living, practices that help us know the holiness of the world in which we find ourselves, and the holiness that inhabits us. We gather in the midst of all that brings light into our lives. The wisdom stories handed down in our tradition, the various sources of wisdom from the natural world that sing to us, the teachings of great spiritual guides like Jesus of Nazareth, the songs that have made their way from composers to communities and singers, the lived experiences we bring to this moment, the meaning-making moments that have shaped our lives to this day. We take this time, as we do each time we gather, to light a candle with one another. So I invite you to light a candle in the place where you find yourself as we light this candle here in our space. The 
We light our candles to honor our spiritual quest, to honor the light we both seek and celebrate in our evolving spirituality, and the light we seek to reflect in the circles in which we live, to members of our family, to those with whom we work, to those beside whom we live, our neighbors, strangers, and friends alike. May this time we share with each other open us to seek light, to reflect light, and to honor the light that is within one another. We thank you for sharing your candles at home with us by sending photographs. We're grateful to Wynn Thompson for the candle in her home that she lights that she has shared with us today. A mountain has long been a symbol of challenge, a symbol of an obstacle, something to climb. And in today's story, it is definitely that. It is something to climb. But more than that, this story tells us the journey of Mabel. And Mabel shows us that a mountain is also a symbol about the power of community. To build up and support, or to discourage and dampen in the face of a challenge. We know what kind of community we want to be a part of. Let's see Mabel's story now. Mabel and the Mountain by Kim Hilliard. Mabel is a fly. Yes, she is small. Here's a human hand. And here's Mabel. But she has big plans. Mabel's big plans by Mabel. Number one, climb a mountain. Number two, host a dinner party. And number three, make friends with a shark. As everyone knows, when you have big plans, it is important to get started straight away. Mabel's friends were not very helpful. Stay at home. No. Flies do not climb, they fly. Oh, Mabel, it can't be done. Ridiculous. But Mabel knew the truth about big plans. Do not listen to those who say you cannot. Listen to those who say you can. I can do it. Mabel went to find a mountain. Well, this nose is too easy. This cake, hmm, too wobbly. Perfect! Mabel started at the bottom. After a few hours, she wasn't at the bottom anymore. But... She wasn't at the top either. This is hard. And Mabel wasn't the only one with big plans. Some were faster. Some were stronger. Some were louder. And some were plain rude. A climbing fly. <laughs> Mabel wanted to give up. Or at least change her big plans. Mabel's Big Plans by Mabel. Number one, climb a tree. Number two, eat, a, eat dinner. Three, make friends with a sheep. But a little voice deep inside Mabel's heart said, keep going. When times were tough, Mabel thought happy thoughts. 
She even made up her own theme song. Give me an M, give me an A, give me a B, A, E, L. Put them together, what do you get? Mabel! And eventually, after a great many tiny steps, one very small fly reached the top of a very big mountain. I did it! Back at home, things had changed. Introducing Jeremy's Big Plans! I'm writing a book! Have one of my cakes. I'm building a robot. Listen to my new band. What will you try next, Mabel? And of course, Mabel was ready for her next adventure. Because as everyone knows, when you have big plans, it is important to get started straight away. I can do it. I think she's going to make friends with the shark.
We've heard Mabel's story. I want to tell you another story. This is Don Mosman's story, as told by Mary Reynolds Thompson in her book, Reclaiming the Wild Soul. From the age of 19 until his mid-50s, Don spent more than 30 years in San Quentin State Prison on San Francisco Bay, one of the toughest penitentiaries in the country, and the only one in California with a death row. Spending hours of each day in his cell, Don gazed through the bars at Mount Temple Pius, the full-bodied mountain that dominates the local Marin County landscape. He decided that when he got out, he would climb to the top. That was 1989, when he was set free. And he did, just as he had planned. At the summit, Don reached out his arms. It was as if he held the entire bay within his two hands. The light bounced off the water, off the San Francisco skyscrapers, and flooded the distant horizon with a soft glow. Looking out, Don realized that he hadn't been anywhere or seen anything. He had spent most of his life incarcerated. Mount Tamalpais stands only 2,574 feet high. As mountains go, it's quite small. But in Don's process of climbing to the top, everything changed. His view of the world and his dreams for his life got bigger. Don began walking to the 12-step meetings he attended to help him stay clean and sober. It didn't matter how far away the meeting or how long the walk. San Francisco to San Mateo, a journey of 25 miles, that was not unusual. But he didn't stop there. He kept walking, crossing America on foot, not once but three times, eventually earning the nickname Walk and Dawn. He slept under the stars in the rain, Trapeze dusty trails, wore through multiple pairs of shoes, and lived large over thousands of miles. In committing to one mountain, Don's view of life expanded. It now stretched all the way to the far horizon. More than any other landscape, the mountains shift our perspective. What we see and know at the bottom of the mountain is not what we see and know at the top. Here above the tree line, the view broadens and widens. We're lifted out of the routine of our habitual life and granted a new vision. How we see things is how we make meaning in our lives. It shapes the way we think and feel and believe. At times, I've felt so stuck and blind about my next step that I've literally dashed up the hillside near my home just to see things differently. Sometimes we need the physical perspective of looking out from a great height in order to perceive our lives in a new light. I've heard Don share his story many times. He is grateful for and incredulous of the life he has today. He loves to laugh and he's gone from prison inmate to published photographer. That's quite a climb. A photographer, after all, is someone who applies his or her unique vision to seeing the world. And now Don has a large, wide-angled vision of life, one that he generously shares to inspire others, including those who still suffer behind bars. Sometimes, we need the mountaintop perspective to see through the eyes of the soul. May we be inspired by Don Mosman's journey, and may the words of Mary Reynolds Thompson bring some wisdom to our living.
Here is a paraphrase of a passage from the book of Matthew in chapter 5. This is adapted from Brian McLaren. Great crowds followed Jesus from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after, he sat down. And his disciples came to him. And he began to speak, and he taught them. He said, we bless the poor and vulnerable, and those in solidarity with the poor and vulnerable, for theirs is beloved community. We bless those bereaved who mourn for loved ones they've lost to illness and violence, for they will be comforted. We bless those brave enough to be nonviolent, for they will inherit the earth. We bless those who are insatiably hungry and thirsty for justice, for they will be filled. We bless all those who choose to be merciful rather than vengeful, for they will receive mercy. We bless all who choose to be pure in heart rather than deceitful and hypocritical, for they will know love. We bless all who choose to be spreaders of peace rather than spreaders of hate, for they will be called children of life. We bless all who are persecuted, harassed, heckled, rejected, and mocked for standing for justice, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people persecute you and utter all kinds of vile against you falsely for standing for goodness and truth. They are treating you in the same way they treated the prophets who were before you. In these ancient words of encouragement to a new and struggling community, may we all find wisdom for our living.
On April 3rd, 1968, the night before he was assassinated, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke in Memphis, Tennessee in support of striking sanitation workers at a rally, addressing poverty, racism, unfair labor practices. King's rhetoric traversed the terrain of so many inequities. He inspired the poor and vulnerable of his people to boycott companies with unfair labor practices, with racist hiring policies, to protest racial and economic injustice, and to be brave enough to be nonviolent. Had he lived a long life, he would have celebrated his 92nd birthday two days ago. But at 39 years of age, this speech would be his last. Facing the realities of death threats, he acknowledged he may not live a long life. He may not live to see the freedom and equality that they were struggling for together, but nevertheless, he had been to the mountaintop. And like the legendary Moses who led slaves toward freedom, King too had glimpsed the promised land. He had seen from afar what he dreamed was possible. And with his words on that last night of his life, he took all of the listeners to the mountaintop with him. He gave them a glimpse of the long arc of the universe that bends toward justice. He gave them a glimpse of that long struggle for genuinely right relationships and that view from the mountaintop has kept that movement alive long after King breathed his last breath. A first century storyteller puts Jesus on a mountain to give his friends a radical vision of the human experience. Matthew could have set this core teaching in any geographical context, but he gave the mountain as the context for Jesus to take his followers. Now, we're not talking Mount Kilimanjaro here. We're not talking Machu Picchu or Everest. We're not even talking Mount Robson. We're talking about hills. These higher ground this rather gentle slope that overlooks the Sea of Galilee, like this spot where the Church of the Beatitudes commemorates this story. Perhaps it's a rise of land much more like Sugarloaf Mountain in northern New Brunswick, the hill behind the community where I grew up. I could see it from my bedroom window. It was the mountain that I climbed every summer in my early years and have returned to many times in my adult years. A mountain from which I could see the roof of my house and I could pick out my school and my church and my community. I could see the Restigouche River and the Bay of Chalur. I could see across the bridge the First Nations community on the Quebec side of the river. My mountain gave me an overview, a vista 
of the community and of the geography in which my life was lived, a different perspective of my life in this place from the view I had on the ground. When the story places Jesus on a mountain, he's in search of higher ground, a place that offers a different perspective, a place where you can see far into the distance, a place that offers you a bigger view, a place that rises above the present and gives you the long view, a place where nothing stands in your way of seeing, and a place where everything is shrunk into Tonka toy and dollhouse size. In this place, there's some space for the Spirit because the view from the mountain alters your perspective. It's in this geography that Matthew places his version of the central message of Jesus. A message which offers a radical paradigm shift. It turns everything upside down. Those who are most blessedly alive, he says, are not those who appear to be. It's not the emperor. It's not the corrupt temple officials. It's not the puppet king. It's not the rich or the powerful. It's not those who hold on to control with violence or corruption or exploitation. But those who are most blessedly alive are poor, vulnerable, hurting, grieving, oppressed. Those who are most blessedly alive know the pain of life whether it's their own pain or the pain of another. This radical body of teaching that we have called the Beatitudes, a poetic opening to the core teaching curated as the Sermon on the Mount, is really a vision of a higher humanity. Unlike King's speech, in Memphis, on his final night of life. These words attributed to Jesus of Nazareth were not likely an address or a sermon that was delivered to an audience on any particular day in first century Palestine. But a few generations after the death of their beloved teacher, those who found life in the alternative wisdom of the essence of the Jesus message, structured it into this poem in the ancient Semitic wisdom tradition. And what we hear in this poem is a revolutionary message so radical that in 20 centuries plus, we are still unable to truly live into its aspirational alternative paradigm. In the world as seen from this mountaintop, poor lives matter. Those who are grieving matter. Being insatiably hungry and thirsty for justice is at the heart of what it means to be human, to be brave enough to be nonviolent merciful enough to not be retaliatory, and truthful enough to live with integrity is to be most truly, most fully, most deeply, most blessedly alive. Just as Martin Luther King Jr. was trying to do centuries later, Jesus was about inspiring a dangerous unselfishness, 
a deeper and higher humanity, a new way of seeing ourselves and one another, seeing ourselves as kin, as neighbor, as family. Oppression and inequity depend on keeping people low. Oppression and inequity counts on limited visibility. Oppression and inequity depends on limiting perspectives, possibilities, dreams, hopes, visions. It thrives by eliminating the bigger picture, by keeping us myoptic in a deluded selfishness. And Jesus was about inspiring a new ethic to turn away from the values of the empire, the values of the occupying imperial power, and live a dangerous unselfishness that will build a new and genuine human society what he called the kingdom of God and others have called the beloved community. The prevailing ethic of his time depended on humiliation. The new ethic he taught was grounded in humility. The prevailing ethic is enforced by power over. The new ethic is grounded in the power of love. The prevailing ethic is looking out for your own. The new ethic knows that love isn't love until it includes our enemies. The prevailing ethic is greed. And the new ethic is generosity. Seeing with the eyes of the poor, the vulnerable, the grieving, the humble, the persecuted, the many who suffer so the few can prosper. High ground is not only found in places where the movement of tectonic plates has heaved up the ground. High ground is also a geography of the heart. High ground is found within us where we see largely and bravely and boldly, where we see beyond ourselves, where we hear the cries of the world as the pain of our own hearts. We find high ground in the landscape of our hearts when we bring our tears into conversation with our fears when we bring our hopes into the light of day from the threshold world of our dreams, we can choose high ground even when we cannot find any common ground. The wisdom of the mountain doesn't require raising the elevation of land, but raising our eyes and the eyes of our hearts to a higher place. Raising our spirits to new seeing, new knowing. We don't have to drive four hours to go to the mountains. The mountain is a landscape for the spirit in whatever moment we will just pay attention, open to the larger view, the longer view, to seeing ourselves, seeing each other, seeing our circumstances, seeing our world from higher ground.
Friends, I want to share a few invitations with you. We invite you to be with us on Zoom immediately following this gathering just for a time to check in and say hello to one another, coffee and chat. We'll sign in about uh, quarter after 11 um, Alberta time. And we would welcome you to come, whether you can come for a few minutes or you can come for the entire time. We look forward to seeing you and um, just having an opportunity to say hello to one another. On Tuesday, we invite you to be with us for the second in the winter series of Tuesday Topics. We are hosted by SSUC Saskatoon. And appropriately enough, this week, on the day that follows Martin Luther King Jr. Day in the United States, tomorrow, on Tuesday evening, as we gather, we'll we'll be focusing on systemic racism and white privilege, engaging in conversations with a black man. And so we invite you to uh, join us. It's at 6.30 um, um, Mountain time, 7.30 Central Time, and uh, if you'd like to sign in 10 minutes earlier at 20 after the hour, there'll be an opportunity to visit and have just a little conversation with one another before the uh, engagement with the topic begins. I also want to express deep appreciation for all the ways that you have supported the work of SSUC whether it has been by continuing to volunteer at our food bank so that that service can be offered each week, whether it's been to help with the music, or whether it has been to help with the technology, whether it has been to help with our other outreach endeavors, uh, those that we have carried on, uh, commitments to the community and to the mission and service of the United Church of Canada over these pandemic months. We thank you for all the ways that you offer your time, your talent, your energy. We also invite your financial support for those of you who are able to contribute to our expenses, to assist us by making a contribution online or an e-transfer, mailing a check, or setting up pre-authorized remittances to come from your bank account each month, or to support us by buying grocery cards. In whatever way you lend us your time, your energy, or you bring yourself to be with us in these spiritual gatherings, we are most grateful. We'll share together in some words that come to us uh, from our friend and colleague Greta Vosper and words that we've uh, shared together many times as we strengthen our intentions to live in a higher uh, vantage point and with higher values. Let us speak these words together that you find on your screen. In caring for one another, may we be untiring. In challenging one another, 
may we be respectful. In sheltering one another, may we be faithful. In holding one another, may we be tender. In forgiving one another, may we be generous. And in loving one another, may we be all these things and more. As we seek to live our highest values, may it be so. We take this moment of intention to change our light from flame to smoke. And as we do so, may we commit to sharing the light of our love. May we find high ground in each day. May we see with the eyes of our hearts May we be kind, generous, gracious, giving. May we be safe and may we be well until we're together again. <laughs>